Okay, um, hello. Uh, so I think this is the first Axion talk um, in comparison to WIMPs. And I will be talking about the DFSC Axion searches today um, at IBS CAPP. Um, this is, uh, if you've listened to my talk last year, it's sort of a continuation of what we've done. And um, this time we have preliminary results, so you'll be able to see like what kind of limits we've uh, achieved um, this time. So um, um, since this is the first Axion talk, I'll give you a brief introduction to Axions and the Axion Halo Haloscope experiment. Um, it's not going to be very detailed. I think there will be more talks um, re re related to Axions that will explain more about that. And then I will talk about our experiment, um, the overview, the equipment, um, how we did the experiment, and then the data acquisition process and the results that we've achieved for it. So the Axion itself, um, it comes from, um, it comes as a solution to the strong CP problem. So um, in the QCD of Lagrangian, there is a CP violating term. Um, unfortunately, we do not observe this um, term because it's very close to zero. Um, well, we would think that it would be, have a value that's, has, uh, it's, that is much higher in terms of order. So we need a solution to um, basically say why this is so close to zero when we don't think so. And the petsi quinn theory um, implements um, a new symmetry that um, dynamically eliminates these effects for CP violation. And this uh, implies the existence of um, the particle, um, which was called the axion. So um, the axion it has these kinds of properties. Um, it has a mass that's around the micro uh, electron volt range. Um, and because of how the um, Lagrangian term works when um, it is possible to detect the axion that's converted, that is converted into a photon um, when there's a strong, when there's, when it's under the presence of a strong magnetic field. So this is the main uh, method for um, trying to detect the signal um, with cavity experiments, um, such as the haloscope experiments that um, are, um, I've done. So the axions are also a very strong um, candidate for dark matter. Um, the dark matter itself um, has evidence from galaxy rotation curves, et cetera. I think you've heard all of this before. Um, and because it's now accepted um, as a mainstream part of the um, Lambda CDM model, um, we have a lot of different candidates, such as the WIMPs um, from the previous talk and axions. So yeah. Um, the axion detection um, using the microwave cavity. This is the haloscope experiment that um, I will be talking about today. So because um, even though we have this um, particle that's called the axion, we don't actually have a known frequency for it at the moment. So in order to find the axion, we have to search um, through a various range of frequencies. And this, is all, this also includes various um, sensitivities. So what we want to achieve is a system that can tune frequencies um, with the resonant cavity um, and also achieve it with high sensitivity and um, low noise. So the cavity itself has various resonant modes um, and which we can choose from um, that can enhance the signal power of the converted photon. And then in order to change the resonant frequency of the cavity, um, we usually um, employ um, a tuning rod. In this case, um, in our experiment, we have um, copper, but sometimes it is also dielectric depending on which experiment you're looking at. Um, now we have the external static magnetic field, which allows for the axion to photon conversion. And this signal is picked up via an antenna and amplified through various amplifiers, and then read through uh, a digitizer or a spectrum analyzer in some other experiments. And we will be looking at it through the frequency domain to see if there's a signal. Um, also, um, in order to achieve low noise, um, Usually the experiments are conducted inside a cryostat and a dilution fridge. So we will be looking at basically millikelvin temperatures um, where the cavity is located at to reduce noise power as much as possible. 
So um, the axion resonant cavity and signal power is the next thing I'm going to talk about. Um, since we need to maximize the signal that comes out from the cavity, we have to um, take a look at various things, one of which is the mode, uh, resonant mode that we're looking at. So this C factor, um, it's called the form factor, um, depends on how the electric field is aligned inside the cavity and how the magnetic field is aligned um, um, the way it's installed. So there are various modes that you can use, but in cylindrical cavities, the most, um, the mainly used one is the TM010-like mode because you can see that the electric field and the magnetic field are aligned very well. Um, there are other factors that um, con um, contribute to the strengthening of the signal power, um, including um, the volume, um, the strength of the magnetic field, etc. So now, um, there are also two different kinds of main couplings that we use. Um, you can see that the DFSC axion itself has a lower number than the other model that's mainly used, which is the KSVZ axion. So because of this, um, the signal power that, we t that comes out from the experiment is actually much lower for DFSC, which means we need to take more time in order to reach better sensitivity or um, bolster the other factors that we have over here. Um, another thing that we have to consider is the scan rate because we don't know the frequency. So we have to look through various frequencies as quickly as possible um, depending on the sensitivity we, we're targeting. And that um, here is a basic, basic relation um, with all the factors that we usually consider um, when looking at the scan rate. So here is an overview of the CAPP-12 TB experiment. Um, the experiment itself um, is capable of searching through 0.8 to about 4 gigahertz. Um, right now, we have a dilution refrigerator. Um, currently, it reaches 25 millikelvin with the load, which means the cavity, and in the presence of a magnetic field. So the magnetic field comes from the superconducting magnet. It's a hybrid of niobium tin and niobium titanium. The center field is 12 Tesla at 4.2 Kelvin. And one of the major selling points of this is that it has a very large diameter. So we can, since we need to also um, try to maximize the volume of the things inside as well, um, a large diameter is very useful. The resonant cavity that we use has a copper tuning rod, and it has an unloaded quality factor of about 100,000. And the way we amplify the signal with um, low noise is using a Josephson parametric amplifier, a, a JPA. And we will be using very, several JPAs within the tuning range of the cavity. So here is a look of our dilution refrigerator. Um, it's from Leiden Cryogenics um, without anything. So basically the mixing plate itself, um, we actually um, achieved a low of 5.4 millikelvin. And then after we mounted, um, this is without the magnetic field. Um, the cavity um, and <coughs> mixing chamber are in the 20s. So the mixing chamber itself is around 22 millikelvin when we um, mounting the cavity. Um, the other part, the superconducting magnet, magnet um, from Oxford Instruments has the big bore of 320 millimeters, like I said. Um, this, um, although it was slightly delayed due to COVID, um, we managed to install it in 2000, um, 2020. And we can reach both 12 Tesla in both driven and persistent modes. So in case of the um, data taken for our, um, the first results, um, we started with driven mode and then we're comfortable enough to go to persistent mode without um, worrying about things like uh, a magnet quench. Um, we also have, this is not exactly related to the magnet, but uh, we also have a real liquefier in operation to save as much liquid helium we have because the um, dilution fridge is a wet type and we need to um, dunk it in um, liquid helium. So the superconducting magnet looks like th um, this with the dilution fridge inside. So this is 
um, how it looks like um, with all the components installed. Um, it's pretty messy with a lot of lines and everything, but it's, it works well. And here is the data that we have to show, show that the cavity cools down to around 25 millikelvin, um, even with 12 Tesla. So this is the actual temperature of the cavity um, when we were taking data. Um, here is a look of the cavity. Um, the cavity itself is extremely light, so it's easy to um, mount it um, without worrying. Um, it reduces the thickness and increases the height to maximize the volume. So uh, although the maximum um, magnetic field we can achieve is around 12 Tesla, because of the volume, um, it's the actual average magnetic field inside the cavity is a little bit lower. However, it's um, optimized to try to take advantage of both the perks of the volume without losing too much of the average magnetic field. So we have around 37 liters in terms of the full volume of this thing. And since the tuning rod is extremely light, we, only, we can actually use the piezo um, without um, attaching anything in addition to it to just simply um, move the tuning rod. Um, it has a sapphire axle uh, here. And here are some here's the simulation data of the ultralight cavity. Um, we have a frequency range of about 1 to 1.19 gigahertz, 1.2 gigahertz. And the form factor, um, it's constantly around 0.6 and higher. So um, basically, this shows uh, how well the system works. And here are the actual uh, measurements. So without the tuning rod, so this is the cavity um, by itself as a function of temperature and frequency. And on the right is the loaded quality factor, but it's close to the unloaded quality factor. So we can achieve something like 170K um, in terms of unloaded quality factor without the tuning rod. And even with it, um, this is the data that we took. So from 1.09 to 1.11 gigahertz, the loaded cavity, it, uh, loaded quality factor is around um, a bit higher than 30,000. And then um, ta um, taking into account the antenna coupling, the unloaded quality factor is around 100,000. Um, um, here is a look of the Josephson parametric amplifiers, the JPAs that we use. Um, Basically, what the JPAs do, um, it, <coughs> the, it can amplify the signal of the <coughs> signal, and it can do this um, through various frequencies. So you can adjust um, the resonance, um, active resonance of the JPA, depending on what kind of flux bias you put inside the JPA. And this is also done with extremely low noise. Um, we use a phase ins insensitive method, so we do have to take account of the noise. And yeah, and that, I'll show you that in a, in a bit. So yeah, here is a, a look of the actual JPAs that we use um, in collaboration with the University of Tokyo and Riken, I think, R-I-K-E-N. So I'm um, putting this JPA all together with the whole system. Here is a look of the RF chain that we use. So if there's a signal that comes through, uh, it will go out here to through the output, and it will be amplified by the JPA um, this way. Um, this is a measurement of the noise temperature um, and the gain of the JPA at the frequency range that we took data at for. Um, and this was measured at 28 millikelvin from the noise source, not the cavity. Oh, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go quickly for the rest. So the data acquisition process, um, after we did all the testing, um, um, we basically scanned the 20 megahertz for its first run. Um, the data was acquired in March. Um, this is the, including some time for maintenance and stuff. So the actual, um, scanning rate that we achieved was about 1.4 megahertz per day. Um, we plan to um, increase this later so um, with more improvements. So the data taken with 
was taken with a digitizer, um, including all the auxiliary data we need for analysis. And here is a look of the raw spectrum. You can see how it looks like. Sometimes we have spurious peaks that we don't want. We filter these out. And the orange is basically the spectrum without this part. And we try to find a good baseline using the SG filter, um, the savitsky gole filter. And here is a look of the noise temperature that we obtain, obtain um, after um, we take the noise power for, after removing all the gain that includes the JPA, the HEMS, and everything at 300K. So af um, the data analysis itself um, shows that the data follows in a uh, standard normal Gaussian distribution after um, taking account to of the correlations. And this is well matched with the simulation. However, there is some, <coughs> there's a slight um, drawback to using the SG filter because um, of how it responds to a signal. So it, the signal power will be cut and that will be taken account to um, in terms of efficiency. So here you can see that the efficiency of the SG filter and other things that we do in analysis, including rebinning, um, takes around 80% off the signal. Um, we are looking to improve this um, with um, a better use of SG filter or some other way of measuring the baseline without losing too much signal power. So um, after including all these results, um, right now here is a preliminary look of the exclusion that we achieve with this work. Um, this is a look of where we stand um, with the other experiment that achieved um, the FSC, the ADM, ADMX experiment. So yeah, um, in summary, um, right now we have all the components working together and we've taken data for it. Um, and hopefully we will increase the frequency range of the experiment up to about four gigahertz. Um, and hopefully with um, a much faster scanning rate than what we have um, so far, which I think is still um, a pretty um, impressive um, scanning rate itself. So yeah, um, that's the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. On slide 19, we have distribution. Uh, I think uh, 19. 19. Mm -hmm. So what is the spin at the far uh, right at, at uh, uh, 6? Right. Six, yes. Do you know what the spin is? So um, these are the rescan candidates we have and the ones that we look to um, sort of cut. Right now, I just showed the data of the um, process before the rescan candidate um, rescan was done, but yeah, we are looking to remove them. Um, so it shows the data, and we don't have um, an actual candidate, or maybe we do, and <laughs> we'll say it's the axion. Yeah. Yeah, the second question from eight: um, When you move the rod, how much does the temperature increase? Right. Um, the temperature of the cavity does not seem to increase a lot because of the graph I showed here. But on the other hand, the temperature of the noise, you can see it increases a little more than expected. Um, we do think that this is from um, a temperature rise from the sensor places that we can't really um, look through, like the rod, for example. So yeah, we do look to improve this as well um, by increasing the thermalization, but right now that's the case. Great. Well, thank you very much once again. And, uh...